Um, I'm John Agee from Sacramento, and I'd like to talk about uh, how this mechanical device can transmit an extension torque to the PIP joint and uh, grow it straight, if you will. I have a conflict of interest. Uh, when I was a young guy over 30 years ago, I opened up a new practice, and the first thing was delivered was a brand new machine shop in the back and a freezer for cadaver arms, and I've been having fun ever since. So we actually make this device and we ship it out of our little facility. Well, pretty much all PIP contractures are secondary to a torque imbalance. You've either got too much flexion torque, such as in Dupuytrons, or a variety of reasons why you have too much extensor torque, or a combination of the two. And of course, torque is the, a product of the force on the extensor side, in this case, multiplied by its moment arm to the axis of rotation of the joint. You can see in this Dupuytrons, there's a very large moment arm on the flexor side for that Dupuytrons band and nodule. And I'll have a few slides, and this is a very good example to talk about in which the fate of the PIP joint depends upon the fate of the NP joint. This is an ulnar nerve palsy, of course, and uh, notice how the extensor mechanism here moves away from the skeletal plane and has a bigger moment arm for PIP or NP joint hyperextension uh, secondary to the ulnar nerve palsy. The same biomechanical problem uh, occurs in PIP joints in Dupuytrons, PIP joints that cause NP hyperextension. Well, the device is uh, pretty simple. It's uh, a rubber band motor that slowly grows the joint straight over a, a period of time, two to three months in the bad ones. And we always talk about stretching it, but it's really just the right amount of force will cause something to grow just like reversing your child's club foot with serial plastic <coughs> cast. Uh, putting it on is pretty easy, just two threaded pins uh, in the proximal end of middle phalanx. Of course, uh, that pin's a little bit long, so you ought to back that out so it doesn't irritate the profundus. And, uh, when it's appropriate based on the surgery you do, you install the device and initiate this extension torque. And this is a patient from some years ago. Uh, he had both MP and PIP joint disease. You can see that the central part of the device is just a rubber band motor with the dental band uh, transferring the force to the middle phalanx and therefore to the PIP joint with the counter force provided by this uh, link here, if you will, around the little cuff on the hand and the whole the purpose of it is that the hand is free on his palmer side so the patient can wear the device and use the hand while their finger joint is growing back straight. So in all these patients, you need to do two things. Uh, you need to grow the joint straight and then you need to do something to restore the joints to, uh, torques to normal. In the case of Dupuytrons, it would be excising the bands and nodules in other conditions such as a boutonniere, you've got to get the joint straight, and then you've got to fix the central slip. When I started off with this, uh, it's been about 25 years, I thought um, you'd end up having a little chart you'd look at, and you'd say, this is the diagnosis, and this is how crooked the finger is, and you use this amount of torque for this amount of time, and it'll grow it straight. Well, I was completely wrong, and in biologic systems, Mother Nature decides how you do things. Uh, the engineers made this graph of three different grades of dental rubber bands, it shows the, the torque in gram centimeters on the vertical and the uh, angle of, uh, of the device and therefore the finger joint on the horizontal. And you can choose anywhere from about 100 to say 200, 250 gram centimeters of torque. This is an earlier device, but essentially what happens is you need to spend a little time with the patient uh, when they get the device and they start to hook it up and educate them. And if you have just the right, right amount of of force, you're going to continue to improve the extension of the joint, and uh, if you have too much, you're going to have pain and swelling, and it'll be counterproductive. And the patients are really the best ones to figure out how to do it. You can see when they have the device on the finger, you can flex and extend the finger with either version, and they can take it off and shower and so forth, and it's not a big burden. Well, I'd like to lock, talk about the mechanics, the biomechanics, if you will, of a finger with the deformity and focus in two areas, uh, kind of like from the PIP joints point of view first and then the MP joint. And of course those blue dots are just to remind us to look with our x-ray vision underneath the skin and recognize there's an axis of rotation. 
We've got some flexor tendons that have a lever arm or a moment arm, the profundus and submus to flex the fingers. Powerful guys compared to the extensors. And we have this <coughs> disease which has a contractile element that bends the joint into flexion. So first, the Dupuytron slowly pulls the PIP joint into flexion. And second, the palmar tissues concomitantly shorten uh, the joints axis from the joints axis all the way to the palmar extent of the skin. And, and third, if the profundus and sublimus moment arms have increased for whatever reason during this period of time, your finger is in trouble. So in the picture in the bottom, you can see an artist depiction. There's the axis. And each the profundus and sublimus have a defined moment arm by Mother Nature before this process took place. And uh, that moment arm dictates the amount of torque that occurs as the patient uses the hand and that little wimpy extensor tendon has to compete with it, but the system, remember, is perfectly designed. And if anything is done to destabilize that situation, either a capsular release here that will allow the flex PIP joint to have its volar plate mechanism in suspension of the profundus and sublimus move even a few millimeters in a palmar direction, you're going to significantly increase the torque delivered to the PIP joint. And the other thing that can happen is anytime you, you cut the, uh, the beautiful little cruciate and transverse fibers in this area as opposed to the really rigid pulleys, you also will increase the, the moment arms of those tendons that are responsible for recurrence. So this is just a little uh, series of dots to remind us that when you have these patients, if you can figure it out, the, the uh, lateral band is always moving in a palmar direction when you have a fixed contracture and unless that lateral band can remove dorsal to the axis of rotation of the joint. Uh, once you get the finger joint straight, you have, uh, you have very little hope of re restoring active extension <coughs> to the PIP joint. Well, let's look at it from the MP joint's point of view. First, the PIP contracture increases tension in the MP's extensor. So whenever, <coughs> whenever the PIP gets contracted here, it actually pulls on that muscle tendon unit so you have greater tension here and that contributes to MP hyperextension. Second, the PIP flexion decreases the tension in the MP's flexor tendons here. So once that flexes, those puppies are relaxed and that decreases the flexion torque here and, and then slowly the finger evolves into a claw deformity in many cases unless the Dupuytrons prevents that at MP joint level. So the PIP flexion creates, creates NP extension torque, and that torque plus time causes NP hyperextension in many patients. So the, the NP hyperextension actually decreases the extension torque available for the PIPs. When this guy tries to open, open and close his hands, the, uh, the effect of the extrinsic muscle tendon units just wiggle his MP joint, and the poor PIP joint at the end of this stage is just sitting there impotent, if you will, to get better. So the short story is each PIP joint contracture creates extension torque for its own MP joint. Well, when the MP, when, when the MP does not hyperextend, it's kind of good news in a way. The PIP extension torque is optimal to either reverse or restore or maintain the PIP joint extension that you can obtain. Well, this is a patient I took care of about two years ago. He's a fellow in his 50s. He has uh, bad news diabetes and uh, peripheral neuropathy with complete intrinsic atrophy of all the muscles in his hand, and he doesn't claw his fingers. He had dupitrons bad enough in the ring of little fingers for surgery, and this is post-op. And I think in these kind of patients, you can keep their internal splint, if you will, that keeps the MP joints in neutral to slight flexion by being careful to just release these puppies. And that's one of the few cases I can think of where two diseases sort of work in synergy. Well, back to the topic at hand, on the flexor side of the hand, of course, everything shortens in dupitrons, that's the skin, and everything that's involved with what I call the machinery of the joint. That's the collateral ligaments, the capsular ligaments, the volar plate and its tails, and the flexor tendons pulleys that embrace them and keep them snugly up underneath the palm side of each PIP joint. Whereas on the extensor side, just the opposite occurs. Everything lengthens, skin, joint capsule, extensor mechanism, you name it. And after a while, as folks have suggested today, 
it does become impotent. And the reason for its impotence is unproven, at least in my hands. And if you put on a device like this with skeletal extension torque, uh, it will grow the PIP <coughs> joint straight. You don't want it to stretch anything. You want it to gently grow them. Everything on the extensor side will then shorten. Everything on the flexor side will then lengthen. Well, of the things I have to say today, I think these two slides are the most uh, important. If you're going to grow the PIP joint straight, you really only have two options. Splints and casts, which transmit, transmit a force through the skin to the PIP joint, or skeletal torque, if you will, in which the force goes through the pins, uh, ultimately to the joint. And I'll show you a simple experiment that'll tell you why one works and one doesn't. Well, of course, the traditional splints that go back to Bunnell's days in San Francisco, uh, if it's not a bad contracture, these puppies do work together with seroplast or KS. <clears throat> but if it's a really rigid one, like many of our Dupuytron's patients, it needs a little more horsepower, I think, unless you're going to open it up and cut something. So this, uh, this is uh, looking down from above, down towards the floor. This is a simple slide from the lab, glass slide, and this finger is holding it so it hinges. We're hanging a 50 gram weight at the tip and lifting up with the pulp of my finger, and you can see uh, it just barely starts to blanch. But if we shift the, the tip of the finger back towards the hinge, this is really not halfway, but about 40%. The, the force goes up to, say, 100 grams per centimeter, and it's clearly blanching there. And, and that little problem, of course, uh, is much worse with the skin on the dorsal side of the PIP joint. So if you put that amount of pressure on the, on the skin and the finger, like we did in leprosy in Carville, Louisiana, the, uh, you're either going to get pain where the patient's going to take it off, or if they've got a neuropathy where they can't tell, they're going to get a red spot or blister or an ulcer, and you've got new problems. So with skeletal torque, you avoid the skin problems, you can reverse the contracture, and then you have to restore the balance of the joint, which in our case is excising the bands and the nodules. So this patient, uh, he had it pretty bad in his index and his little finger. I operated him on just a routine procedure with a zigzag incision and took the bands out. Things uh, came out straight there. The little finger uh, took everything out but didn't bother with the contracture at all, and I put the, uh, the pins in place. And then typically when the wounds are healed enough after a post-op pressure dressing, say at 10 days to two weeks, we then add the device to the finger and initiate the extension torque. And the next two months, uh, he grew out straight, not entirely straight, but pretty good, full extension and full flexion. And unfortunately, as noted by everyone here, these don't always hold up, but at least initially, it's pretty easy. So if you grow the PIP joint straight, the skin's to length, and you, and you ought to maintain the normal mechanics and the normal flexion torque from the profundus and subness. If you do things surgically, I can only say, why release these joints if you can grow them straight? But uh, these are the problems that, in quick summary with surgery. Your skin's still short. There's solutions for that. If you cut the lateral retinacular ligament, which you don't have to do all the time, but if you cut that puppy, and it gets trapped up in the scar of your post-op disease, and that's going to keep the lateral band from ascending dorsally, and it's going to keep you from getting good extension. And if you do anything to cut the capsular ligaments or the tails, if you, that little dash line right there, if you cut that puppy, when the finger is in flexion, the portion, increasing portion of the tension in these is going to displace the flexor tendons in a palmar direction and increase their moment arms there's what it ought to be in any, any division of those uh, tissues. It doesn't have to be like this. Just a few millimeters would be a 20 or 30 percent increase in the moment arm and therefore the torque that these powerful flexors generate for PIP joint flexion. So <clears throat> any release causes increased moment arms, that increases the flexion torque and recurs the contracture much earlier than it otherwise would. Let's look at a, a final last case. And then we'll close. This is a fella uh, in his 40s, uh, previous surgery, ring of little fingers, both sides, PIP joints. His MPs weren't involved, as I showed you. We put two devices on him, and when he got out this straight at about six weeks, uh, we took him back to the operating room and made the zigzag incisions, which were easier to do, take the diseased tissue out, uh, stitch him up, pressure dressing, and then when the wounds are looking good, which in his case was right away, 
uh, put the torque back on and grew him out to this point. He had incomplete uh, extension still, but good flexion. And in all these patients, I think you, the therapist, or the patient in, in this patient's case can do it himself. There's the change in joint angle PIP as a function of time. And when the graph keeps, uh, you keep the torque going until the graph tops out and flattens. And I used to pull it off right here. And uh, my hand therapist, Cindy, told me not to do that. And she was right because there's an elastic rebound that would encourage you to keep it on for at least two or three more weeks. And then they're much less likely to droop back down after the torque is removed. So in summary, torque imbalance plus time, everything lengthens on the dorsal side, everything shortens on the flexor side. And if you put skeletal torque on it, you can get everything to shorten on the extensor side and everything to lengthen on the flexor side. Thank you very much.